like to ask our next panel to come up, please. Just wanted to um, welcome everybody back. Uh, I, I was born three days after the Leafs last won the Stanley Cup. So <laughs> I'm, uh, in my family, I'm the, I'm the one to blame. Anyway, uh, my name is Jordy Ayton. I'm going to uh, moderate uh, this next panel. I just want to introduce first the, uh, the esteemed panel that I have uh, in front of you. Um, First off, uh, to my immediate left is Blair Henry. Uh, Blair is a uh, ethicist working at Sunnybrook, uh, a member of the Joint Center for Bioethics, and a faculty member in the Department of Family and Community Medicine. And he has a master's in theology and a specialty in bioethics from U of T. And to my far left, um, Rabbi Torchina, um, is the Rosh Beit uh, Midrash at Yeshiva University in Toronto. A, uh, he mentors uh, rabbinical students from Israel and from abroad. Um, he's on the executive committee of the Rabbinical Council of America, and he uh, ha offers a course on Jews and food, which um, must be a long course, at least as far as I'm, my experience uh, goes. So I welcome both of them. and. Um, the panel today will be discussing uh, this question. Should Ontario government, should the Ontario government fund uh, patient desired life sustaining medical intervention where there's no hope of ameliorating a patient's condition? And the whole issue of is money the elephant in the room? Um, a couple of background notes on this issue. The cost of operating a ICU uh, bed is approximately $2,500 a day, or between $750 and a million dollars a year. In Canada, there are 6.7 critical care beds per 100,000 persons. Contrast this with the U.S., where they have 25 uh, critical care beds per 100,000 uh, persons. It's anticipated that in the next 20 years, there will be a need for 50, a 57% increase in the number of critical care ICU beds. And yet, the majority in the Supreme Court of Canada said almost nothing about the issue of resources. Um, specifically, uh, all they said was, uh, this case does not require us to resolve the philosophical debate um, over the public interest in not funding treatment deemed of little or no value. It was only in the dissent where this issue was even raised. Um, and the dissent talked about a patient's autonomy must be balanced against broader interests, uh, including the impact on the broader health care system and the integrity of that system. And what the panel is going to discuss is how do the scarcity of resources fit into decisions about uh, treatment, end-of-life treatment, and particularly the Rizzuli case. So I turn it over to uh, Blair, who's going to lead off. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me to participate in this conference. As some of you may know, I was the hospital ethicist who was involved early on in the case of Mr. Rizzuli. Uh, in our hospital, the ethicist has a formal role in end-of-life uh, disputes to ensure that some due process and policies are followed when we attempt to define the appropriate goals of care in cases where the family and the healthcare teams disagree. This process is fundamentally based on the application of set principles uh, informed by what we would formally call procedural justice. However, once the case moves into the legal realm, legal counsel takes over and my involvement generally ends. Uh, at this point at the talk, I always like to say that I, I rely heavily at this point on Bernard Dickens' famous statement that you know, the law is the minimum ethic. And so we, uh, we transfer that over to, to lawyers to, uh, to take forward on their journey, uh, which you've heard earlier on this morning. 
I don't need to tell you, uh, or those of you present in this room today, that history has many stories. There's the story that's being told by the family. There's a, a different but compelling story that's often being told by the hospital team, which includes the physicians and the nurses and the administrators. There's a story that plays out at the bedside, a story that's described in the courts, and finally, it's the story reported into the press and played out in the public domain that compels a lot of our emotional uh, attention. Each story provides a different but compelling perspective of that singular event. So I'm not here today really to provide a new or surprising version of the Rizzuli story. What I hope to do today is maybe to place this story into a larger context of healthcare and to grapple with the complex questions of how this issue needs to be positioned in a future where resources may outstrip demand. However, before moving into that central part of my talk, I do want to make one interesting point about the Rizzoli case. Um, I have known the Rizzulis for three or four years now, and, uh, and we're very uh, much on an amicable and, uh, and uh, uh, intimate level, actually. We, uh, we embrace when we meet each other, uh, Mrs. Rizzoli or Mrs. Um, uh, his wife, uh, Dr. Solomon, and uh, we talk often about the journey that they've undertaken to this point. Uh, their daughter is a uh, wonderful young uh, academic. She's studying at um, uh, Wilfrid Laurier University. And the Globe and Mail asked her, uh, during the Supreme, leading up to the Supreme Court uh, case, um, how the family was doing, how he was doing. And she responded uh, by saying, we reassure him every day that it is going well. And then in the same breath, my father has become a representative of the value of life. And I think her statement uh, was rather prophetic because I, I don't call it health care anymore. I really call it value care. I mean, medical decisions offered and made reflect a deeper value or worth, one that goes beyond the mere statistics and prognostic estimations of outcomes. In many cases, it's a question of how much we value life in its myriad forms and manifestations. I mean, our vocabulary may sound technical, but trust me, all of our actions and the actions of many family members are based on core beliefs and values. Today, I want to talk to you about the F word. Uh, and by that, I mean futility, just to put our sponsors at ease. A um, few words today in the medical, legal, and ethical realm evoke such strong reactions as does this word futility. Because I think when it's used, it epitomizes a strong sense of disvalue at all levels of discourse, be it at a you know, physiological, psychological, emotional, monetary, or medical level. It's, it really is about a disvalue of some, of some sort or another. Um, an underlying point of uncertainty in medicine is the determination of when medical treatments are actually, in fact, futile. And if the criteria is accepted, can it then be applied to justify the withdrawal of life support therapies without the consent of a patient or their substitute decision maker. Well, the Supreme Court of Ontario, or the Supreme Court of Canada, in its Rizzoli reading rulings, uh, have given us the answer to that, um, to the latter issue. And, and no, withdrawal of life support cannot proceed without consent. My talk today is not an attempt to comprehensively, comprehensively address the ethics of funding decisions. However, my underlying goal is really to attempt to separate the issue of futility from the rationing of healthcare dollars, such that they do not become conflated together, because I think that that's a mistake if we bring them together at this point and juncture of our, of our history, uh, and especially in navigating these thorny issues called futility debates in ICUs or, or high-intensity units around the world. Really, to speak of today's talk, uh, begs us to ask, why are we talking about this anyway? And I think that most of you here uh, have a real key appreciation for the five, what I would call, underlying key factors that motivates why we're talking this talk today, why we're having this talk today. The first one is that healthcare costs are increasing, and increasing spending is perceived to be unsustainable for our economy. Secondarily, medical technology is increasing. The ability to slow 
and even uh, temporarily stop death is achievable now in our ICUs. And that line between extending life and prolonging death is even murkier. Um, and once somebody is in the ICU, we are effectively medicalizing death. And, uh, and that uh, is a change in the way we understand this process of dying for us. We also, number three, we know that a disproportionate of our healthcare dollars are being spent in the last year of life. Fourth, there's the proverbial tsunami of the aging baby boomers, and everybody is concerned about the fact that the demand will soon outstrip the supply. And fifth, which I think is not often discussed, but I think is an, is an underlying power dynamic to it, is the hidden conversation that is underlying the effort to curb what I would call the scope of patient autonomy. If you look at the history of medical uh, interventions and medical care, um, the, we have a, a long-standing history of medical paternalism, where the doctor always decided. And uh, since the 50s and 60s, there's been a patient advocacy and self-determination movement uh, that's coupled with many civil rights movements that have pushed that over now into what we call the, the, the power of autonomy. And um, I think that the pushback against paternalism has reached its nadir. And healthcare is not a commodity. Ultimately, it's about who decides. And I think that that's the power dynamic. Who should decide at the bedside? Who should decide? Is it the doctor who has the training, or is it the patient or family who, um, who is experiencing the event? So understanding the link between futility and its de facto association with rationing resources uh, requires that each of the above points be considered in detail, but regrettably that's beyond the scope of today's talk. However, I believe it suffice and important in, at a minimum to acknowledge their import uh, these considerations have in the discussions around healthcare rationing, given that they contribute significantly to the ethos of the situation, or phrased in a different manner, they provide a unique and specific context for the story currently being told. Now on the question of ethics. Of historical note, and it's mentioned by our earlier panel, uh, the statement often used when discussing a defending medical futility is attributed to Hippocrates, who implored that physicians should refuse to treat those who are overmastered by their disease. Now, Hippocrates can be, you know, call can be interpreted in two ways. The first is kind of an admonishment to physicians to always be aware of the limitations that medicine has in the face of serious illness. It asks them to be somewhat humble, that they don't have all the answers. However, the second opinion on this call is a potential ob objective marker, one that permits physicians to designate if and when um, decisions to transfer a patient from aggressive to supportive or palliative care should be made. My cautionary note here is always to remind ourselves that Hippocrates was talking to the doctors. He was not talking to the patients or the families. I think it's important to note that established and accepted in the legal and ethical lexicon of the limits to the duty of physicians is the acceptance that our current society does not obligate physicians to provide treatments they believe to be ineffective or harmful to patients. So I did want to speak up at the last Q&A uh, because somebody had mentioned about you know, putting in their advanced directives, you know, if I want to have everything done, uh, you know, does that obligate the medical team to do that? If it's clearly stated my, in my objective, in my uh, advanced directives, the answer really is no. Uh, not if it hasn't been offered. The key is it needs to be offered, and then you know, we understand what would be accepted. The difference now is withdrawing that care. The Supreme Court decision just talked about the removal of life support, not about the giving of life support. The primary medical objective is, to, uh, is and remains to be, first of all, do no harm. However, to move further into the conversation, the issue of determining ineffectiveness and harmfulness really needs to be clarified. In many futile cases or futility cases, the consideration of harm in a physiological sense 
can be somewhat obscured by the fact that many of these patients are heavily sedated on strong opioids and otherwise deeply or minimally unconscious. Harm from the medical team is typically framed as providing a form of care that they consider to be inhuman and therefore the treatment should be thought of as harm and maleficent. This is often dismissed and mitigated by a family's members by either perhaps religious operatives at play or personal attestations that the patient in the bed has always been a fighter and would accept this level of treatment no matter what. Now, futility hinges on uh, the issue of, of certainty and how virtually, you know, what is the question of virtual effectiveness of a treatment is typically called into question. Would somebody consider a 1% chance of survival, 2%, 5% chance of survival be sufficient cutoff to determine futility? Because it really is about percentages. Though never stated outright, many physicians have looked at the issue and probably would state about a 1% chance of survival uh, is significantly poor enough to warrant that treatment to be called futile. But I ask, would you, do you consider yourself to be maybe that 1%? Uh, many families do. However, futility can be understood in a number of ways. It's not just physiological, but it could be benefit-centered and it could be operational, uh, operationalizing futility. If futility can be understood as a strict medical determination, and the problem is that the power of knowledge really does lie clearly in the hands of the physician. And so their decision should trump those of the family. As one can see, the ethical conundrums abound uh, with such cases. I believe it's important to understand the, the word futility as kind of a relational word or construct. The intention of that word is to form a link between an action and a desired goal. That being said, when one, then one needs to ask, is it reasonable that aggressive therapy have as its goal the delaying of the eventual bodily death of an individual? Is that a good goal uh, of a therapy? If a life of minimal consciousness on life support of therapy is a desired goal of an intervention, and of course, who should decide that? Um, we, uh, we have no consensus on this issue. And I think we need to do a lot more talking before we can ever reach that point of consensus. I think any calculus that's based on an assessment of benefit to harm or the identify, identification of a goal of care must take the consideration of all parties involved. Ultimately, the only statement that can be defended is that medical futility relates to a specific medical decision about a specific medical treatment to a specific patient. It's not a societal decision, it's an individual decision. So the question that was asked over and over in uh, the, the forums by the press was basically, is medical futility really a smokescreen to hide cost containment? And I think that definitionally, the word medical futility and rationing share many common features. However, I think it's really crucial to note the important differences in the etiology of both terms. Rationing is a process typically, as a process, typically has a backdrop of scarcity as its driver and usually appeals to themes of justice for answers. Medical futility, as I stated before, is based solely on treatments and outcomes for specific patients. In cases of scarcity, a community agreement is needed to guide clinical action. And I draw you to the attention of the, of the case of organ donation in this country at this stage. We can clearly, clearly say that we, have, and we do not have enough organs to meet the demands evidenced by those waiting and dying on the wait list. So we do need criteria for determining who can have access to an organ and how their prioritization on the list should be determined. I don't think we're quite there yet with critical care beds, at least not regularly. We have rules helping to determine who gets in the door of a critical care unit, but no acceptable determination on who needs to leave the unit except when death occurs. And then I thought, well, that's not necessarily the case anymore either. If you had followed the, the, uh, the case of the young uh, child in California uh, whose family recently um, 
decided that brain death was not a good s criteria for the declaration of her death and had her continued on life support and even moved uh, until um, to another facility. Uh, it's interesting because I thought about uh, and, and uh, spoke with a colleague from Winnipeg the other day and um, I don't know if, if you know the Samuel Gobelchuk case in Winnipeg, very similar to the Rizzuli. And I think what made the Rizzuli case unique was it was the first one that we could get to the Supreme Court of Canada to make a ruling. There had been many attempts before, but the patients died before that. So Rizzuli was the, the founding stone of an ability to actually bring it through the legislative process or through the, the legal process to its, you know, sort of the, the Supreme Court for a ruling. Um, when I asked my bioethicist colleague in Winnipeg about the Gobelchuk case, he had mentioned that, uh, you know, on average there was always three or four ICU beds available in the city throughout the entire stay. So would his, would it, is it a scarcely driven decision purely? Uh, I don't know what the answer would be in terms of Toronto's ICU bed uh, status at any given time throughout the, the Rizzuli case. So all this, of course, begs to then ask the question, how big is the problem? Or is the problem even big? Um, these issues become big and conflated in the news, uh, but they don't happen on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, although there were times as an employee of Sunnybrook, I had to stop and wonder about that statistic for, for a little bit. Um, so if we're able to stop all cases of perceived futility, futile, futile care, how much money would we save the healthcare system? Regrettably, this isn't a well-studied phenomenon. And a criteria, and the, the various criteria of futility makes it really challenging to make that determination. However, researchers from UCLA, and specifically the RAND Corporation, looked at the prevalence cost of ICU care provided, to, uh, provided, provided in an ICU by physicians that perceived the care to be futile. Now, this study was released in JAMA uh, last year. Though the study is a small one and has limits for generalizability, I believe it, it's helpful to look closely at the results of this study as it does provide some insight. So the study took place in a single healthcare system that comprised of five ICUs in use at UCLA. The researchers analyzed reports from 1,125 patients and found that 904 patients, or about 80%, did receive appropriate care. 80 or 98 patients, or 9%, probably received futile care. And 103 patients, or 11%, perceived what the physicians clearly determined was futile care. So in their analysis, the most common reason the treatment was seen as futile was because the burdens of aggressive therapy grossly outweighed the potential benefits. And that's always the calculus that we're making. Are the benefits greater than the burdens? Because health care and, and uh, medical care is a burden to individuals. Um, there's pain and suffering involved, though we try to mitigate that. But is the overall, will the benefits outweigh that? Um, their analysis of benefits versus burdens uh, were based on the issue of, you know, such issues such as could the treatment, the treatment would never achieve the patient's goals, or that death was so imminent that the treatment wasn't going to prevent that from happening, or that the patient would never be able to survive outside of an ICU, or that the patient was permanently unconscious and therefore never able to benefit from the, the therapies that were provided. So those were the criteria used. Now the study involved finding, uh, provided insights into the patients, into which patients they were more likely to be assessed as receiving futile care. And by example, patients admitted from nursing facilities or long-term care centers were likelier to be assessed by physicians as receiving futile care, suggesting that patients whose health is already compromised are less likely to benefit from critical care. But I think this attribution bias, hmm, they're coming from a long-term care facility, older, frail, is it the treatment or the individual that's futile? Um, of the 123 patients who did receive futile treatments, 85% died within six months, most of them during their hospitalization. The surviving patients were left in severely compromised health states and were often dependent on life-saving modalities to go on. We know, what we know is that of the 15%, or what we don't know is of the 15% who were discharged from the hospital, what would their quality of life be like now? Actually, would futility be the words used to describe their ongoing care now? 
So this, this, these studies often leave a lot more questions unanswered uh, and I think make it hard to generalize uh, these studies into actual day-to-day um, -day activities. But, um, but they're important nonetheless. So the average cost of a treatment in the ICU in the US, which is a little bit more expensive than your quote, was $4,000 a day. And so for 123 patients uh, perceived to receive futile care in those ICUs, the cost encouraged during three months of the study amounted to about $2.6 million for all five ICUs. Although sizable, um, this accounted for only a small percent, 3.5% of the overall hospital budget. So I think the talk or the walkaway points of that is that more care needs to be taken in determining if the patient or the treatment is considered futile. More, more work needs to be done to account for how a preventative approach might appropriately address these cases earlier on in the ICU admissions. I think there's a better low-hanging fruit to try and grapple with patients who are getting the care that they don't want than those that are receiving care that somebody has a problem giving. Overall, financial costs attributed to futile care amounted for 3.5% of the hospital operating budget, but I would suggest that's, that's a small cost in comparison to the emotional costs that this has derived for families and clinicians and nurses who are at the bedside. Futility estimates if based on mortality and ability to achieve an outcome that a patient can meaningfully appreciate, they seem reasonably accurate, but it's not 100% accurate. So let's not forget we are only referring to medical futility. So in conclusion, the study I used in my talk does identify potential cost savings as a basis or rationale for empowering healthcare professionals to stop the provision of futile treatments. However, I believe that futility in the face of rationing healthcare resources is a necessary but insufficient consideration. Too much uncertainty, lack of consensus exists to support its use as a definitive criteria to reduce healthcare costs at this time. For the time being, I believe that futility determination should remain in the domain of the unique doctor-patient relationship and that rationing and other systemic savings, cost savings efforts should be best relegated to the larger policy and public level discourse. Thank you very much. much. Rabbi? Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate. This is my third year and inevitably I learn a great deal in preparing for the, uh, for the presentations. Um, they're not all as fun as the moot court we did a couple of years ago, <laughs> nonetheless. I want to thank B'nai B'rith and the, the sponsors. Um, and I also want to reiterate something that was said on the last panel but from a slightly different angle. Uh, regarding the emphasis on creating powers of attorney, um, I, before moving to Toronto, I was a synagogue rabbi for a dozen years, and there are a few things you can do for family members that are more important than providing a power of attorney that states what your wishes are, even if they're vague, but in, obviously you want it in the clearest way possible, but I think it's, it's crucial. It's an unintentional but horrific cruelty when people leave family members in the position of making life and death decisions for them and don't give them guidance on, uh, on how to do it. So I think that's something that, uh, that really ought to be done. The question posed, uh, as it was put to me, is, um, is money the elephant in the room? So I, I don't know a whole lot about elephants. Um, money may be a little bit. <laughs> Um, but yes, money is, is very much an issue here. Um, if you, you know, have the opportunity to look at the paper that I wrote that's included in the binder, um, I began by quoting several, uh, several sources from various places uh, across Europe were the ones primarily that I brought, um, in which uh, writers said, yes, there are issues of resources, there are issues of money, and we need to recognize that providing care for one is going to take away care from another. To quote one, um, economists, managers, and health policy makers think that it is wrong, even unethical, not to consider that resources are limited. If these are inefficiently allocated, they can impede other treatments with higher benefits in terms of health and life saved slash cost ratio. Uh, yes, we have to worry about our resources. So the question then becomes, and the question put to me, uh, what would Jewish thought have to say about the issue of rationing life-sustaining care um, due to cost concerns. 
So there's a lot of room to argue. Uh, I could stop there when I'm talking about Jewish thought. There's a lot of room to argue. But they, there's a lot of room to, to contend that Judaism would accept uh, a rationing of life-sustaining care due to cost concerns simply because cost concerns can lead to inadequate treatment of other patients. It's not a new issue. Uh, Jewish communities faced this issue a couple of thousand years ago, not in terms of the type of care that we've been discussing this morning, um, but in a separate setting. Uh, Jewish communities uh, living in the Roman Empire, uh, obviously a decided minority uh, and a powerless one at that, um, were besieged by bands of thugs who would kidnap Jews and sell them into slavery and communities would dedicate funds for what's called in Hebrew pidyon shvuyim, redeeming captives. But they ran into trouble because um, when you pay a ransom for, uh, for one captive, you send a message to the captors, which is, hey, we can make money doing this. And so you encourage them to do more, and you encourage them to raise the price. And the communities had to deal with the fact that they did not have infinite resources. They couldn't ransom everybody and they couldn't create a situation in which there would be impetus for more kidnappings. And so, rabbinically, they created a policy of we're not going to overtax the community, as I brought on the, uh, the first page of my article, one may not redeem captives for more than their market value for the sake of general communal welfare. The, uh, simply because you can't. You will, you'll destroy the community by redeeming captives for, quote, more than their market value. That's a statement from the Talmud, a principal text in the development of Jewish law. And the, uh, there's more to be said on that, on that position itself. There are limitations on that position. So, for example, if you know that someone stands to be murdered by his captors instead of being sold, then all the rules go out the window, and we do ransom. Uh, despite, the, despite the cost. Nonetheless, this established a principle of rationing which is employed um, in, in Jewish thought and in Jewish law. That's number one. Number two, when you're dealing with medical care, we do distinguish between care which is going to heal somebody, by which we mean deal with whatever illness is at hand and restore the person to normal life. It was said earlier that we're all terminal. Nonetheless, to, to restore the more comfortable type of terminal than the, as opposed to the immediate. Um, we distinguish between that uh, and care which cannot do the same. So, for example, I recorded on, in, uh, on the second page of the article, a ruling from a little over 100 years ago from a rabbi, Rabbi Yisrael Meir Kagan, who lived in Rodin, Poland, and he dealt with the question of somebody who wants to save people from a fire. And he goes into the fire and he sees that there are two victims there in the fire, one who is healthier and one who is clearly dying. And no matter what is done, even if he's taken out of the fire, we're not going to be able to, to prolong his life beyond getting him out of the room with the fire. And so he said, one who can save either a healthier person or a dying person from a fire, you have to choose between the two, must save the healthier person. He posed it as, a, uh, as an obligation. And this comes up in Jewish law in modern triage situations. I brought the position of Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. Rabbi Moshe Feinstein was a major authority in Jewish law uh, in the 20th century. He passed away in 1986. And he dealt with a case in which two patients are brought into the ER simultaneously requiring immediate use of the same resource. And he said that if doctors estimate that one patient could be, heal could be healed and the other one could only have his life briefly extended, then the doctors should give the resource to the patient they believe they are able to heal. So there is precedent for, number one, rationing, as seen in the hostage cases, and there is precedent for distinguishing between care that can provide a more prolonged benefit and care that, that will provide a shorter-term benefit. Having said all of that, um, rationing is still problematic, I believe, uh, for three reasons. Number one, um, because even if care is not called full healing, such that it will be outweighed by other care, um, nonetheless, there's a clear imperative in Jewish law to provide aid to somebody else under what's called the duty to rescue. Uh, the duty to rescue takes various forms in Jewish tradition. I brought some of them in my paper. The most obvious and the most well-known is the biblical verse, Lo tamod al dam reyecha, you shall not stand by as the blood of your neighbor is shed. So that even if all I can do is delay the shedding of blood, nonetheless, I have an obligation to, to do that much. 
even if I'm only going to provide temporary aid. And perhaps the best example of this is regarding the laws of Shabbat, the Sabbath. Within Jewish law, we take Shabbat, we take the Sabbath very seriously. And generally speaking, it will not be overridden for almost anything within Judaism, within Jewish, within Jewish law. Um, one exception, though, is that we override Shabbat, we override the Sabbath in order to save a life. So then the question becomes, well, what if you're going to save a life, but only by moments? So they give the case Talmudically. Again, this goes back a couple of thousand years, but the modern analogs are obvious. They give the case of somebody who is in a building, and the building collapses. And the people searching through the building, trying to find the victims, see that, yes, they could take this person out from under the debris, and the person will live an extra half hour, an extra 15 minutes. But they know the person is going to die. And they know that in order to get the person out of the wreckage, they're going to have to violate the Sabbath in order to do so. The rule is you do it. We say that, um, that even temporary life, what's called in Hebrew chaye sha'ah, overrides major principles within Jewish law. So number one is that we do accord great value historically and traditionally to temporary life. Number two is a thorny issue, and that is the relationship that one has with the patient, with the patient what I call in the paper the duty of care. Um, we have a principle within Judaism that there is a special relationship between provider and patient, and this, of course, is seen not just in Judaism. This is seen in, in secular law as well. As I noted in the paper, current Chief Justice McLaughlin of the Supreme Court of Canada uh, declared in a 1992 case, the relationship of physician and patient can be conceptualized in a variety of ways. It can be viewed as a creature of contract with the physician's failure to fulfill his or her obligations giving rise to an action for the breach of contract. It undoubtedly gives rise to a duty of care, the breach of which constitutes the tort of negligence. Within Jewish law as well, we have a principle of not abandoning those we have already begun to care for. And here I refer back again to Rabbi Moshe Feinstein in a position he took. We quoted him before in terms of the case of two patients who come into the ER simultaneously. Well, what about a different case? What about a case in which I have a patient who I am currently treating, who I can only you know, extend life for by a matter of minutes or hours, and then someone else is brought into the ER needing the same resource, and that patient could actually be cured. That patient could be given a life of many more years to come. What do I do? Do I dismiss the current patient and then take this other one. So Rabbi Feinstein ruled that no, one is not entitled to do so. As I quoted here in the paper on the third page, once he is brought into the unit for treatment, he acquires the space. Whether he pays for his time in the hospital, whether he does not pay, he's treated for free is irrelevant. The, uh, the patient has acquired the space. The patient has a right to my care as physician, and I'm not entitled to, uh, to dismiss him. So... Obviously, that creates problems when we're dealing with rationing care within a hospital setting because the patient's already there, the patient's already being treated, and so that's a second problem. And then you get to a third area, which I have to admit is fuzzier than the other two, but frankly, to me, is the best argument of the three um, that I'm going to present, and that's society's compelling interest. Um, I think, that, first of all, the idea of society having a compelling interest that will trump case-specific need is well established, not just in Jewish tradition, but in, uh, but in secular law. One of my favorite examples is in the area of confidentiality, where we say that in order to preserve a legal system in which clients are going to trust their lawyers, lawyers are not allowed to divulge information other than, other than in very limited circumstances. They're not allowed to divulge information that they receive from their client. What if that information could lead to the harm of a third party, very serious harm? So other than very specific circumstances that are outlined by the law society in, in the rules of professional conduct, generally speaking, the lawyer is not entitled to divulge that information. Ah, but there's somebody I know who's going to get hurt. Okay, but society has a compelling interest which is going to override the needs of the individual. And we have that same principle within a Jewish law, such as in the case I mentioned before of not ransoming a hostage. The poor hostage is crying and screaming, saying, save me, right? There's somebody there who's going to get hurt. And I say, yes, but society has a compelling interest in making sure that we don't have a thousand more people like you. And so we say, I'm sorry, but we're limited in what we can do. So there, there, there's great weight to this idea of society's compelling interest. 
Here, I think society has two major compelling interests that weigh in against rationing care. Um, number one, we want to ensure that we don't create pressure on, phys on physicians as well as patients to seize treatment when the treatment is appropriate. Because the lines in these cases are so blurry. It's not like a hostage being taken where you know exactly what the issue is. We don't have a team of commandos who can go in and get them away from the kidnappers. We don't have the ability to negotiate down the ransom. And we know exactly what they're planning on doing, so we're stuck. But in these cases, right, you can have, like the case of Mr. Rasuli, where we're saying he's in a persistent vegetative state, and then suddenly he's not. Right? Things change. Things are fuzzy. I brought in a footnote in the, uh, in the paper a piece from Margaret Dory, who uh, is a, a lawyer in the US. And she wrote an article called Preventing Abuse and Exploitation for the ABA Senior Lawyers Division. And she describes the following. She's dealing with assisted suicide. That's her, uh, her topic there. And she says, I have had two clients whose fathers signed up for the lethal dose. In the first case, one side of the family wanted the father to take the lethal dose, while the other did not. He spent the last months of his life caught in the middle and traumatized over whether or not he should kill himself. And it gets worse as you read her second case. The, um, the reality is that the lines are fuzzy in these cases, and it makes it very difficult for patients. And if we are going to institute a rationing of care, then ultimately we put the, the patients, their families, and the physicians in very, very difficult positions. This is not about slippery slope. I want to make sure to emphasize that. This isn't about if we permit this, then we're going to do that. This is about what do we do in the cases that we meant to address? How do we, how do we handle those cases? The, uh, so that's, that's number one in terms of compelling interest. I think society has a compelling interest in not putting its members in that position. But number two is the pressure on society to come up with better ways. Um, we don't, in general, deal with social problems by creating an out for society. So we don't deal with homelessness by saying, okay, there's nothing we can do. We're not going to take care of them. And therefore, there's no more problem of homelessness. Right? That's not, that's not a, an appropriate way, for I think, for, for a society to deal with the needs of the members of the society. Um, we find that biblically as well. The biblical text promises, it's an awkward promise, Kilo yechdal ha'evyon mi kerev ha'aretz, the pauper will never cease from the land. There will always be poverty. But the response to that is not to say, so, don't give. Or so, put a cap on your giving. Rather, the response biblically is kifa sawach tiftach es yadcha, so open up your hand and give and help the people who are in need. If we solve this problem by saying, well, I'm sorry, we can't take care of them, then we remove the pressure upon society to come up with a better way. And again, this is different from the hostage case and the rationing of ransom money, because there, they don't have the option of developing a better way. They're stuck. Whereas here, we do. I've been reading a book, a remarkable book, called um, Emperor of All Maladies, a biography of cancer. And it describes the evolution of cancer treatment in the past century. I'm only in the first part, so I'm stuck in the 1950s. But, the, but it's remarkable even there to see what has been discovered, what's been developed, and then to think about what we read about in the headlines every day in terms of the advances that have been made. One of the reasons for those advances is because of cases like the Rasuli case. One of the reasons for those advances is because people have relatives in these situations, societies have citizens in these situations, and if we provide an out for society to say, okay, at a certain point we cut off treatment, I think we remove a very important imperative for that sort of progress. So uh, to sum up it, it, briefly, I think that within Jewish tradition, there is indeed uh, a tradition for rationing resources, including for very serious um, for very serious needs, we do distinguish between care that will heal and care that will extend life for a limited period of time. Nonetheless, I think rationing in a case like the Rasuli case is problematic. Number one, because we do have an imperative to provide some aid. Number two, because there's a prior relationship between physician and patient that actually requires that the physician continue to care, 
continue to provide treatment, and number three, because of society's compelling interest in making sure that they don't create these blurry line types of situations that make things very difficult for patients, families, and caregivers, and because we want this pressure on society to actually come up with better ways. Thank you. So I want to open the floor uh, for uh, questions on this topic. Um, if, uh, if there are any, can you just come on up to the microphone? Just want to uh, indicate, of course, that we were supposed to have a third panelist, Judith Wall, of um, the Advocacy Center for the Elderly. Couldn't make it this morning because she's ill, so we, um, we uh, hope uh, for a speedy recovery for her and miss her. Yeah, thank you. That was really great stuff. I wonder whether, I'm just curious to know whether there's another large elephant in the room. Uh, money is funding, is certainly one which I think most of us can figure out. But in my office, uh, what I've heard people talk about to a large degree is quality of life. Uh, we haven't, nobody's addressed that as yet except the rabbi's comments about uh, uh, the measurement of uh, the hostage who has. Uh, whose market value must be a, de a determining factor. I'm just curious to know uh, from the ethicist's point of view and, um, uh, uh, well, there was from, from Jordan's point of view, uh, whether that issue ever comes up as, as a legal issue in terms of um, quality. Thank you. I think it's an important uh, distinction. I, I think we are often, um, in terms of conflict in a hospital situation, debating or conflicting between quality versus quantity of life. And, uh, you know, for many of us, they abound together and there's no need to separate. At some point in one's journey, uh, that, that question becomes uh, paramount. Um, and in fact, to the degree that it becomes the sole imperative. So when people want just to to proceed with palliative care, that is a comfort derivative or comfort only care option that they use. Um, the quantity of life argument is uh, is an equally compelling one, and I think you know it's around the individual and what again what is their value. You know, Try to state you know the issue around the value of care um, is going to what's going to make them want to, to engage in a treatment and uh, what's their, their goal, what's their motivation. And if it's about improving their quality of life, uh, that could be very well the motivation for proceeding down one track. The other is improving the quantity of life. And the quantity of life issue is an interesting one because some people have very compelling reasons. They want to live six more months because that'll be enable them to participate in the, the wedding of their daughter or graduation ceremony. So quantity of life is, uh, has some very important elements as well to it, and, uh, and I'm not, not even touching on the, the religious um, components of that argument. So it is definitely an argument that's in tension quite frequently in a lot of the conflicts that we deal with, and, uh, but we have to go back to the patient and what, you know, what is your value here? What is your voice? They're the ones that are enduring the treatment, so that's important. From a legal point of view, um, the the Act, the Healthcare Consent Act, talks about a patient's well-being, um, and and so if again there's no wish that's that's binding, you're into the best interests of the patient, and and best interest does take into account, I would argue, and I think the case law su uh, supports this, the quality of life as well as the length of uh, quantity of life, and so it does. Of course, those are issues. I mean, people who draft powers of attorney, and many of us do, I mean, we've all had clients who say, look, I don't want to be kept alive in the, these circumstances, or, you know, I've had patients or clients tell me that they, uh, they booked their trip to Switzerland, um, and they've got it all planned out if they're ever diagnosed with this, that, or the other. So quality of life is obviously uppermost in many of my clients' uh, minds, and, and it is imported in the, in the um, Healthcare Consent Act as to how decisions are to be made. I just wanted to point out our third panel discussion, which will take place after the break, analyzes several cases where, in assessing best interests,
parties addressed uh, what is the quality of life. Mm -hmm. I have a quick question I wanted to ask the panel about Leonard Thompson. I want you to put your mind back to December 1921. It's already the there. Yeah. <laughs> you may not remember. If you don't remember the 67 Stanley <laughs> Cup, you're not going to remember this. <laughs> It's pre the discovery of insulin. Leonard Thompson is coming into the hospital. They know he's a diabetic. I'm, I'm focusing on Leonard Thompson and the concept of futility. If the doctors at that time, since there was no cure yet in December of 21, would that treatment for him to keep him alive until January of, of uh, the next year where they tried insulin, would that have been futile? And if so, how does that impact, because clearly my point's not lost on anybody. You just have to wait a month and insulin was around the corner and his health improved dramatically. So how does that impact on ethicism, end of life treatment, and understanding what the real world, what the real word futile means, given uh, medical sciences race to better treatment. Thank you, Charles. That's a good question. Um, I uh, I sit on, or used to sit and chair a research ethics board, and, uh, and I, I fondly say that in research ethics, it's, it's it's still the only domain where paternalism is alive and well. Um, you know, we, we make decisions. We are ultimate gatekeepers of what gets put through uh, studies. And I can, um, at one level, say that quite fortunately, the, the difference between 1921 and uh, 2014 is, you know, humongous in terms of the time delay that we have and the regulations around using experimental drugs on patients, uh, especially in acute care settings. So. The, the, the mixture of, um, of innovation, new treatments, cutting edge treatments, and experimentation, and standard of care in healthcare settings is a very carefully crafted one. So that the staging of new chemicals as they go through uh, the testing, up to the point where they can become approved drug of use for clinicians. So. Physicians, when you go into a hospital, they, uh, they're duty-bound to provide you with the standard of care that they know and can exercise safely and understand. They have some latitude to use medications that aren't approved for you uh, on you because of information that they may have privy to. So we call that off-label usage. It takes a risk for a physician to do that, but there's enough of a gray literature body of evidence to support why you know, I can give you this drug that isn't prescribed for you in this way, as long as it's approved by Health Canada. Um, we get a lot of um, issues around amazing stories, and, and, and you're absolutely right. Science is advancing, and around the corner, we don't know what new treatments are going to be available. I, what I'm trying to say is that corner has really uh, elongated because research is such a slower mechanism with all the regulations that when you see a headline of a potentially um, you know, interesting molecule that might have some effect in a clinical setting, the journey between that reporting and its actual availability in a hospital formulary that's approved formulary is a big journey. And I think we just realized even, you know, uh, arguments now about cancer patients and cancer drugs and what are we going to fund and what we're not going to fund. That being said, uh, though I know in clinical setting we've had numerous cases where we've had special approval to use medications that were not approved by Health Canada for compassionate access you know, purposes to, to facilitate patients who just needed to try something else. And, uh, and in some cases, you know, it provided important information for the scientists to continue on. Uh, even though it may have still resulted in the death of the patient due to the underlying illness. Uh, but in some cases, it, it you know, provided amazing, you know, increased uh, longevity in their lives. So um, I think that we, yeah, we don't know what's around the corner. 
uh, but because of all the uh, trials and tribulations that research endeavors have had over the past, we've really brought in that, that corner quite a bit, and um, it's a long journey through that. Uh, but, it's, uh, but there are other access points, so we, we do balance that out uh, in terms of the provision of clinical care uh, quite seriously, and we've done amazing uh, access for individuals, um, but as long as there's some data to support that, that entails you know, some safety information about the drug so that we're not causing more harm to a patient than good, because then, then you go from medicine to barbarism, right, if you are just causing more harm without any, any good, it's a complicated uh, formula. And the, the only thing that I would add to that um, is that uh, we have a principle within Judaism of Elo Ladayan Elamasha Enov Roos, right? The judge can only work with that which he sees in front of him. So while the point about what happens in the case of Leonard Thompson um, is valid, that it's an argument on behalf of quantity of life, it's an argument on behalf of not rationing because of the potential costs that come with rationing where you could end the life of somebody who just another few weeks would have, uh, would have been able to be treated. Um, despite all of that, at the end of the day, you have to make your calculation based on what's in front of you. And so, yes, we will value extending life, and that will be a principal factor in it. But if I have to choose between someone who is known to be um, someone with real prospects for a living and somebody who I can think maybe they're going to come up with something, I'm going to choose the one who has the more known prospects. Uh, we'll just sort of add one other thing. Uh, it's interesting because I think uh, it might be a point of interest for some people to add in their advanced directives that they are not opposed to uh, experiment, you know, sort of um, trials, um, clinical trials that may be uh, available to them on some sort of compassionate or extended basis, so that that's, an, that's a wish that people don't often talk about. Uh, and some people have very much an aversion to being part of a trial. Others are very willing to be. It's an altruistic act. So we can't suppose that there is automatic consent for that. We, we assume that it's going to be altruistic for people to do it. So if your clients are you know, of that disposition, put it, put it in, the, uh, in the advanced care directive. Yes, if the uh, legal decision in the, the Supreme Court decision in the Rizzulli case rests upon the idea of patient autonomy, uh, ethically have, you know, in the idea of the law is that minimum ethic, have we negated any possibility of um, or any balance with uh, societal interest? I, have we privileged individual autonomy in such a way that there is no such thing as uh, a social uh, interest in preservation of life? Um, I think that, you know, that, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. When it comes to um, and, and the decision was around the autonomy. It's, you know, we need that individual's consent to do that. So they're going to decide. And, um, you know, I think that the Rizzulli case, as was described, were two very divergent approaches to this issue. One extending outside of the decision-making requirements, which is what the Rizzulli lawyer was uh, arguing for, and the other was from, this, from the physician's perspective around whether or not, you know, what constitute, treat, what constitute treatment and whether, you know, that becomes a requirement. So I think that the Supreme Court um, has stipulated, but I think it, it only really s clarified what the Healthcare Consent Act of Ontario was basically saying in the first place. It didn't add, I don't think, or take away any additional burdens from society that were not already placed there by the, the existing legislation. Uh, and I think it just solidified that it included uh, the withdrawal of life support as a, as a modality. So. I'd like to just 
take a moment before our break to give uh, our tokens of appreciation to these presenters. Ronnie, can you give me a hand? I sort of feel like the Academy Awards. <laughs> 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 As many of you know, we had an exciting seminar earlier this year. One of our presenters was unable to attend. Her name is Judith Wall. She has graciously agreed to come today and present the paper she intended to present at the seminar. She was part of a panel discussion, which was, by some estimates, the most exciting panel discussion of the day. And the title of the panel, the question it had to address was whether or not the province should fund life-sustaining medical treatment when there is no hope of ameliorating a patient's uh, disease. And the question really was, is money the elephant in the room? So without any further ado, I want to say thank you to Judith for agreeing to come here today, for agreeing to give us your presentation. And just as a little bit of a background about Judith Wall. Anyone who's familiar with the plight of the elderly knows about ACE. And Judith is the heart of ACE. It's an advocacy center for the elderly. And there was no one I, who I was more excited to have participate in the seminar than Judith Wall. And it gives me great pleasure for her to be able to present her paper to you now. Judith? Thank you, Charles, for the very kind introduction. This was a very difficult question to answer. And, and I, uh, and my, you're going to see from my comments, I tried to break it down into, as, as a lawyer looking at this, how do you analyze it? So what are the different factors involved? I looked at the question from the perspective of a lawyer that only represents older adults. So the majority of my clients are anywhere from their late 60s to their early 90s. And issues around eligibility and access to care come up all the time in my practice. So in my practice, we're often disputing denials of access to, to various health services, challenging denials of eligibility for particular publicly funded services, challenging inappropriate charges, financial charges, uh, for health services. Uh, so much of the work that I do is actually a variant of this question. It all loops in together. Money issues arise directly or indirectly in, in all these cases, not just in what people would call end-of-life scenarios. So whether people realize it or not, we have herds of these elephants tromping around the systems, and money decisions uh, money analysis it seems to be in the background, even though it shouldn't be, even it, though it shouldn't be part of eligibility or shouldn't be part about determining whether something is offered to people. And I think that is in the, the, the costs are influencing how people get services in the province. Um, I think this needs to be brought out into the open to a great deal more. Fundamentally, I think money issues are coming into play at the bedside or at times of direct contact with patients and their families when we're talking about decisions for individuals' health care and access to services and treatments. But that shouldn't be relevant because we're, that's rationing. 
rationing is really what the Ontario government should be doing, not the people at the bedside, not the health providers. So if the government sets eligibility criteria, which is part of the rationing process, then the health providers are expected to apply that. But we actually don't have that in our system now, except in, for certain types of services, and, and certainly not in the ICU, not at the end of life care at this point. I think rationing is getting confused with what is medically appropriate treatment. And, and uh, or sometimes people talk about futility, and I'm going to talk about that. But I think those two issues about rationing and futility or what's appropriate are getting very muddled and blurry. And, and the government, I think, would like the health providers to be doing this, but I don't think that's their role. I think that's the government's role. So this is complicated to explain. I'm going to step back and, and talk about these two issues, about rationing and, and the, the determination of utility and appropriateness to explain uh, what my thoughts are. So I think we need to distinguish between these two issues because it helps us decide who we have to talk to and who really has the responsibility for dealing with the, the just two different issues. So what do I mean by rationing? Rationing, I'm sure the government wouldn't like that word applied, but it's, it's, it is the uh, controlled distribution of scarce resources. It is the decisions the government makes all the time in terms of allocation of what's in what budget. Uh, that's part of the rationing process. So certain money is allocated to health, other money is, is allocated to transportation, but we are looking at rationing of the resources available in the province. So in our publicly funded health system, the government allocates the funding uh, for health care. This is rationing. The government indirectly then determines what treatments are available in a broad sense. Government decides how much is allocated to long-term care, to hospitals, to home care. But they're doing this on the, 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 the uh, general level, not on the specific individual client, uh, person level. Even when we have some of those elements in the, the government policy, so for example, the drug formulary. Drug formulary allocates what will be covered through, like, for example, the senior's drug benefit. What drugs can you access through that? There are always exceptions to that, and the government has incorporated various other programs, like the Trillium Drug Program, the extraordinary access to, to certain drugs, to, to accommodate that. So there's all kinds of reviews, because they're not in the business of deciding it for the individual. They're looking at, at the, the, the general funding for, for the drug programs. Um, so when we do, we also see rationing, elements of rationing in the way uh, they, certain statutes are drafted about particular areas of health care. So for example, long-term care. Long-term care admissions, so that's the, the, the admission to a long-term care home, that is a limited resource. There's only so many beds in the province, so many have been funded. The government's decided they're going to fund X amount and that's it. That's rationing. And so for that resource, there is eligibility criteria set out in the legislation. It's, it's based on need. There's no reference to, to funds in that. So you could be very poor and still have access to that, to that uh, resource. In fact, I've had clients who had no income at all and still were admitted into long-term care and actually paid no fees while they were, while they were residing until they received income through, through a disability program. Um, and also, whenever we have these, 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 these eligibility issues like that, or home care is another example, home care you have to be eligible for the program, you have to have, uh, uh, be health insured, so you have to have OHIP, uh, and you have to have certain needs, otherwise you don't get it, you can't just demand it. Um, and in any of these programs where there is that kind of narrower eligibility criteria, there's review processes, so you can challenge the finding of ineligibility. So if that's the fairness. Again, the government is talking about a resource that needs to be rationed, but they want to make sure there's fairness in the process and they provide for that. But it's again, it's a general level. They're not looking at patient A when, when they walk into the Community Care Access Center to determine what do they need and whether they should be admitted. So in contrast, what is allocated or provided to a particular patient in terms of care and treatment is determined by the individual health practitioner or health service provider. Patients can't demand treatments, they have to be offered treatments. And you see the wording in the Health Care Consent Act, it talks about 
patients giving consent or refusal of consent to treatment, but it's to treatment that is offered. So the health practitioner must offer. Uh, so a patient is entitled to receive it just because they want it. Patients seek out pay, care, but health practitioners must determine what to offer based on their medical and care needs. That determination of what to offer has to be done fairly, without discrimination, based on professional knowledge and judgment, and we often talk about on evidence-based reports and, and science. Uh, and so it's, and it has to be related to that individual patient's condition and needs. Money or expense of that of that care is not part of this determination and the health professional is not looking at if this this care is going to cost X amount of dollars should I offer it or not to the patient. They're, they're to look at what is the patient's needs and is it appropriate to meet their needs. Um, and, and this is where discussions about futility arise. So what is futility and who decides whether some treatment is futile and therefore should not be offered. So in the literature, uh, futility refers to care and treatments that are unlikely to produce any significant benefit for the patient. And there's two kinds of medical uh, futility. We're really talking about what I'll call quantitative futility, where the likelihood that an intervention will benefit the patient is exceedingly poor, and qualitative futility, where the quality of benefit of an intervention Will, uh, that, that the quality of the benefit that the intervention will, will produce is exceedingly poor. So if a treatment is likely, is believed not likely to benefit the patient or the benefit is considered insignificant, then the treatment may be considered futile. Now I understand from talking with health professionals, they don't like to use the word futility anymore, that's sort of gone out of style, so they really talk about what's medically appropriate for this particular case because uh, futility sounds too harsh, too final, as if somebody's giving up. And, and um, really, and, and they're really looking at what works to help the patient, to be patient-focused. In talking with other health practitioners, they say that continued treatments in some cases, uh, they may recommend a, a treatment be continued in some cases, even though they, may, they think it may be futile in a sense it's not going to have an exceeding benefit because it may assist the patient and their family for some other purposes. It may buy a little bit more time. It may give, uh, I had a client who wanted to see her granddaughter who was across the country. And, 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 and the health professionals were very uh, appreciative that they continued treatments and until they could have the family reunion. And, and then the discussions led after that about discontinuing it. The concern expressed to me by many health practitioners when I've discussed this with them is they're concerned about harm being caused to the patient by prolonging a treatment when it, it, it may not be doing anything uh, really medically appropriate for them and in fact causing pain rather than, than, than relieving them and giving them comfort. But it is a big balancing at that point. There's no, final, no, no specific definitive line is this is totally futile. Uh, in, in various studies that have been done on, on um, uh, ICUs, health practitioners have said, yeah, I, I did deliver what I would call futile treatment, but it's, it's like 20, 30, 40 percent of what they're delivering. It's easy to say this after the fact, but it has a benefit to the client, so they feel in, in, at the time that it, it is appropriate. So futility really refers to the benefit of a particular intervention f for a particular patient. With futility, the central question is not how much money does this treatment cost or who else might benefit from it, so who else could we pass this on to, but instead, does the intervention have any reasonable prospect of helping this patient? It's not directly a money question as to what is offered. So who decides what's medically appropriate? I think under our law, it is the health practitioners have to have this responsibility to decide whether treatment is appropriate or not. However, uh, it, 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 even though it may be the, health, uh, the individual health practitioner making this decision, all the literature and the guides to health practitioners are saying, you're not perfect, you may not have the perfect answer, no one physician may have all the knowledge. And so often they're, they're making this determination in a team, talking with the team, 
but also talking with the patient and their family. That's an important element of this is to determine what should be what should be appropriate to this patient. You, you can't just uh, uh, decide this in a vacuum. And also, even if the physician felt that a treatment was not um, a, a, a medically appropriate, they should be talking with the patient or their or the appropriate substitute decision maker, if that's the case. Uh, so it gives them an opportunity to get a second or a third opinion, uh, because no one person has all the knowledge. Uh, medicine is not a perfect science. Um, I, I, every time I think about this, I, th I keep on thinking of the the TV show Star Trek, where they had uh, the doctor had this little machine who they they touch the person and they'd know exactly what was wrong with that person and exactly what treatment uh, uh, is best for them. We're not there yet, uh, and in fact. There are a lot of errors made in healthcare in, di in terms of diagnosis or in terms of, of um, well, not, it may not be an error, but patients may respond in ways that, that the phys physicians don't know. So it's, it, it, even if they're believing it may not help, it may help in the end, or it may have a benefit to the person, at least short term, uh, if, the, if the care is, del is continued to deliver. Just thinking of this from a legal perspective, um, it's also smart for the health practitioners to work in the team and to provide that conversation with the substitute or the, with the patient uh, so that they can set aside any issues that the, per, that the health practitioner may be discriminating against the person as to what they're offering or not or, or allegations of negligence. I also need to say that even if something is medically appropriate and a health practitioner offers treatment to a patient, a patient, or if it if they have if it's their substitute decision maker making decisions for them, they may refuse that treatment even if it's life savings. Uh, there are requirements for consent before treatment is provided. What if the patient thinks that a treatment would benefit them and the health practitioner is not offering it? I think this is part of the the, the question the the premise that was underlying the question, and here we are in very murky territory. Uh, you know, as uh, it, when I've had cases where somebody has not been offered a service, we we go through the litany of, is it is it being fairly offered? Is is it not being offered because of discrimination? All my clients are older. Uh, is this appropriate for that reason? Is it? Uh, I was in a hospital situation where, in fact, with a relative, where the uh, health practitioner kept on asking me what the my sister's DNR status was uh, did she did she want a DNR status on her records and she was not capable at that time and and I was actually quite shocked in the way it was asked me uh, uh, because we had not yet got a full diagnosis did hadn't talked with uh, the uh, in terms of a treatment plan and what was more disturbing though is the health practitioner turned to me and said well we have to know this because she's old so the flags went up as to are they saying this to me because of her age and, and, and therefore they didn't feel that she was worth to provide the care. Uh, certainly after that I monitored it much more closely. <laughs> but, but we're looking at is, is, it, is, is the decision about futility based on the wrong reasons? Uh, so we do that kind of an analysis. Um, and then we're also looking at is cost behind that, that question? And I think that does come up in some situations. Uh, not at end of life issues, uh, but I've had this this scenario where somebody, a senior, is in hospital. Uh, they can't return home because of the high degree of need uh, that they have for health care. They can't be accommodated with home care alone, and the health team keeps on telling the senior, "You have to leave. You have to leave the hospital." Um, and we're arguing, "Well, they have a right to be be to wait in the hospital and to be transferred to." long-term care, which is the appropriate setting for the care. Now, are they being told that they have to get out of the hospital because they're worried about the funding for the hospital um, and that this is too costly a bed for the person to be in while they're waiting the transfer? But there isn't an alternative. And actually, by law, the person does have the right to remain in that setting. But we can see the money issue is, is, is getting behind the, the issues and is confusing the, the decision about what is appropriate place for this person to get care in, if they can't get it at home, there isn't an alternative uh, right now except uh, waiting at the hospital until they go to long-term care. But, but that money issue should not be at the basis of looking at what's, what's proper care for that senior. The disagreements between when patients or their substitutes 
uh, want a certain treatment and the health practitioner doesn't want to offer it, believes it's futile, those disagreements aren't always handled, handled well in our system at this point. We've had to have cases where we have seen DNR orders appearing on charts when in fact the discussion about DNR had never been had with, with the patient or their family. Um, when I've asked physicians about what, what is the problem about having these discussions about the futility or about what not being offered, uh, they often say it's very difficult. Uh, it may be very difficult, but I think it's the right of the patient to have that discussion with the health practitioner. And DNR orders should not be placed on charts without those discussions. I don't think that's either legally or ethically appropriate. I think physicians have a legal and ethical duty to communicate openly with the patient or family members about interventions that are being withheld. Uh, or withdrawn and to explain the rationale for such decisions. I think that's part of the consent process. The, it's the aim of respectful communication should you find out the patient's goals, uh, explain the goals of treatment and help the patients and family understand how particular medical interventions would help or hinder their goals and the goals of treatment. Uh, so it's getting back to the discussions to have those discussions, but the cost element is not part of those discussions. So now I'm going to go back to rationing for, for a minute. So the public and patients do expect the Ontario government to fund health care, not just to cure health conditions, not just to make people well, uh, but also to fund health care when somebody has a chronic condition and, and, um, and the care can comfort them and can benefit them, even if it's not curative. Uh, and that does happen. Um, when, when we look at, our, our society expects it. Uh, when, if we look at, in the, in the question we asked if, whether they should be fund care that is life-sustaining, well, much of that care that is not curative is life-sustaining. Um, I have many clients who are in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, they are going to live for, for a, a long number of years with this very um, uh, challenging disorder. Uh, their their health care will deteriorate. Um, they will, um, um, but they still need the care. We we expect that care that they are going to be properly taken care of until their death, even though they're suffering from a a, a, um, a very challenging disability that may end up where they cannot communicate with their family or will have limited interactions with other people because of the disorder. Um, people with, who have disabilities also expect care, even though the care is not there to, to completely um, uh, resolve their condition. Uh, and our society expects that. A person can be profoundly disabled and receive that care throughout their lives. Um, in, in, and we do see the fights now in terms of some disabilities where the Ontario government is not funding enough. So, uh, so people who are living with um, with uh, developmental challenges or with autism are not getting all the care and, he and health services that they may require through the course of their lifetime. And, and, and this has been a, a big dispute about getting allocations, getting some of that rationing to additional funds to, to those people. So these are the expectations in our society. So when we talk about end of life, why aren't we expecting that, that same kind of uh, analysis be applied there, that people be properly taken care of until the end of, an end of their life um, and, and, uh, b um, and, and to receive the resources to meet their needs to the end of the life. So with this forum, the, 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 I know this, this partly engendered uh, as a result of the Rasuli case being decided at the Supreme Court of Canada. And, and looking, and, and I've read many of the newspapers keep on talking about this is a decision about end of life and whether end of life care should include treatments that, that are, are, are futile. But I don't think that was the issue in, in this case. Um, in the Rasuli case, the case was about who decides on whether a treatment is withdrawn or discontinued. And that's a different issue than who decides as to what's offered. Here, that care had already been started, and, and, and it was essential that the health provider and the, and the, and the patient, the substitute, uh, be uh, involved in the dis decision about the withdrawal. It was, it was an issue of consent. If the cost of care of Mr. Rasuli was a consideration, it should not have been. 
because that's an issue for the government to decide as to whether they're going to fund the ICUs, fund the, 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 the complex continuing care that he would need for the rest of his life. Uh, the Rasuli case was really about the law of decision making and the process to be followed. And I think the court made the right decision in that they said that the health practitioners, if they don't believe the substitute is making an appropriate decision on behalf of the patient, have to go to the consent and capacity board. And then at the consent and capacity board could, could do that review as to whether the substitute decision maker was acting in the best interests of the patient. Had the appeal been done from that decision, had the board sided with the health practitioners and not with uh, and not the spouse who was a substitute, that case would have probably resulted in the debate about futility. Uh, instead, we got the debate about who decides. It's the wrong question. It's 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 it's. It, it wasn't the issue that I think they really, really wanted to address. It's a much more difficult issue, and I don't think um, the, the courts would be happy to, to, be, to be faced with it, but they may be at some point. And, and I think governments don't really want to like to talk about these difficult issues uh, because it's very political and, and causes a big uh, furor, but it has to be talked about. Um, I think it has to be talked about because of, and I'm going to get into something very practical and get out of the theoretical. What I see in my practice on a day-to-day -day is the money issues are coming into play in terms of what people get access to, and that shouldn't be happening, even though the money issues are not a condition of eligibility. The government wants to make eligibility, uh, uh, access to finance as part of eligibility, they should be putting that into the legislation and be part of the, the public debate so there could be the discussions and the review about this. So we are getting cases where, for example, in home care, the Community Care Access Center who does the assessment as to home care uh, have asked some of my clients about what their income is. I think it's an inappropriate question. I think what they're asking is, could they pay for some of their own services? Now, I, I don't want to put bad intent to the community care access centers. I think they're looking at, they have a limited funding envelope. They're trying to stretch it across uh, what is a very high demand for services. And so they may be unintentionally looking at who could pay for some of their own services so that we could allocate the CCAC services to those people who can't afford, uh, afford it. But that's happening at the, at it, I'll, I'll call the bedside, the interaction with the individual patient, and that shouldn't be happening there. That should be happening at the government level. And we keep on saying to the CCACs, what are you doing to tell the government as to the demand outstripping your funding envelopes because you're being for, put into a position that is really not your role to play. It's really the government's role to play. Are people being found ineligible for long-term care admission for the, for, on the same kind of analysis? If somebody could afford to pay for what I'll call as retirement home care, uh, they could divert that person out of the long-term care system, which is publicly supported as, part, as, pub, as public health, um, and that opens the, the door to a long-term care home bed to, for someone else. But that's not appropriate. First of all, retirement homes are not long-term care homes. They're actually tenancies. And if you are in a retirement home, you're actually paying for all of your health care, which I also think is inappropriate. But seniors are paying for health care in that system, which, which otherwise they would have funded under health insurance if they were in the long-term care system. There is a two-tier medicine already for seniors in, in that sector. Um, but money shouldn't be the reason why, if, even if somebody is very wealthy, if, they're, if they need long-term care, they should be able to get that placement as well. So for end-of-life care, the cost of care can be very high at end-of-life. Should the decision to, uh, to offer the care be based on the cost? It's not, I don't think it sh is part of the formal determination now, and I don't think it should be in the future. If the government wants to look at that, they should have they should do the research and have that debate uh, it, it, within the government. Now, interesting enough, on the different research uh, studies that have been done on the cost of intensive care and as to whether it's excessive, whether it be, could be cost savings, these various American studies that I know uh, one was referred to by uh, the ethicist at this program, uh, they 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 come to the conclusion that the cost of intensive care is not excessive and that you can't have the cost savings at that point. It's not worth going down that path because it's such a small percentage of the overall health budget. 
Uh, so it is an, it's, it's an elephant in the room for that reason as well, because it's not really the real issue at that point. But when you're looking at an individual, it, you might say, well, it's very costly for that. So it seems simple to look at that. But you've got to look at the big picture, as the government should, if they're really looking at allocation of resources and rationing. And if the American studies are correct, they will find that that's not the place to do the rationing. We, we need to, to look at it in a broader sense. So my last comment, it, it's not directly related to, to, to the issue of whether government should fund or not, but it's, it's related to, uh, as an example of what is happening in the system, um, to, in, I think, in a, in, a, in a misguided effort to cut costs. Uh, we're seeing a big emphasis put on, in health facilities on getting patients to sign what are called advanced directives or living wills. Uh, so these are documents in which a person would indicate what their wishes are for future care uh, if they should become incapable. Um, I think there's good intent. Uh, the idea is that sometimes people are treated with uh, uh, treatments that they would not have wanted, that are more invasive than what they would want. So the idea of, 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 of projecting into the future and indicating your wishes uh, may result in, uh, or is believed to be result in more patient-centered care. But I'm actually seeing the opposite happen with this emphasis on this put it, put, uh, to sign advanced directives. We're finding that people are being told you have to sign this document or you don't get admission into the long-term care home. Or you must sign this document as a condition of getting another service. And that is very inappropriate. So it's trying to limit uh, uh, the resources at a front end when, when, when in fact the person has not been informed, they don't know what's going to happen to them first. And you can't totally project what will, uh, will happen. You can't anticipate what your future care needs will be. So you can't totally express what you would want because you don't know what's going to happen to you. So we see an uninformed decision then being used after the fact, after the person becomes incapable to browbeat the substitute decision makers who are trying to make an appropriate decision for their loved one and being told, well, this is what your relative would have wanted uh, had they, because they signed this advanced directive. But, but this advanced directive was completed completely out of context, without information, without knowing what would happen. Uh, my experience with these documents is that people actually change their minds as they be, as their health changes, they have different perspectives on what is quality of life, uh, what, is, what is a life uh, well living, and what should be done, and what would they want to, to uh, consent to. Um, I think we are losing the, 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 the informed consent in our system, and that's being ignored. And instead, we're, lo we're getting into getting people to sign documents out of context, and it's paperwork. And, and we're losing those discussions. So just as in those discussions about w when a health practitioner thinks something is not, uh, not appropriate, they're not always having those discussions and, and we're getting, that's getting lost. Um, so I wanna thank you for giving me this opportunity to make these comments. I think these are very complex and, and difficult issues. But I think rationing is the business of government, not, the, not the, the physicians at the bedside. I don't think that cost factors uh, should be factored into determining what's offered to a patient. And, and I think the governments have to be very wary about how they get into this discussion. But they should be doing the research. And if the American studies bear out uh, being correct, the issue of end-of-life care is, is, is not the issue that they need to be pursuing and worrying about and, and the costs there, the, the costs are small within the overall global health system. Thank you. I, I do have one question for you. Okay. Let's suppose that the government actually took the step to assess the, the uh, rationing of health care and they made a determination, notwithstanding the American studies, that they had to address whether or not it was worthwhile to spend the money to, to fund treatment that doctors thought was not medically warranted, but either the substitute care, care decision maker thought was, or the patient thought was. What would your submission to be to the government be about 
that, uh, that issue, whether or not they should fund that treatment. Now, you're asking me the direct question, which I try to avoid answering. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> um, I'm going to speak from the heart. Um, I think that uh, it should be funded. Um, I think that there, there has to be flexibility in the system uh, because I don't think science is perfect. Um, I think also we have to, we can't just look at what uh, the physician thinks is, is appropriate. Uh, that's why even in the, uh, uh, that's why even in the press process we have now, um, they're, they, they're expected to discuss it with the patient and the substitute because that's of great value as to what the patient and the substitute believe. Um, I speak from the heart in the sense that I have had friends who have been diagnosed as, um, uh, as, as a, a getting a very limited lifespan uh, as a result of having cancer. Uh, they took the leap to, t to search out treatments that none of their physicians wanted to deliver them. It was still valid treatment, so it's not the, the, uh, the, uh, something that's off, um, you know, out, out of this world. It actually is a, is a form of treatment that would be accepted, I'll call it, in, in, in our community. Um, and they are extending their life. Um, it's important to them to go through that process. It's important for the individual and their families. Uh, to, to go through that. Uh, so I think that's why that flexibility has to remain there. It can't be just a medical decision. Um, it'll be interesting to see if, I, I don't think they'll ever have that debate though, to, to really look at this issue in that way. Um, and I think, um, I, I, I like the, the American studies in the sense of looking at it, if we're looking at rationing, we're not looking at the individual, we're looking at that overall budget and resources, and if that bears out, if their studies bear out, uh, there's no need to go down that path. I hear you. I, I want to make one last comment, if I could, about why I'm such an admirer of you mm -hmm. and of your organization. I think there's a tendency in our community to forget about all the contributions the elderly have made to build our country. I think there's a tendency to look at them a little differently because they don't have the memories that they once had, they don't have the vigor that they once had, and I, I believe we owe them a great debt, and we need more people like Judith Wall, and we need more organizations like ACE to protect the interests of the elderly so there are no slow codes, so that doctors are reminded that these people and their lives have value. So thank you not only for agreeing to come today, but thank you for everything you've done for our community. Thank you very much. Judith, I want to thank you again for coming. And I want to tell you all the people we had at the seminar, including you, I consider champions, champion advocates and champions for the elderly. And we want to give you a token of appreciation for your participation with the B'nai B'rith Seminar. And the person who's going to make the presentation is also a member of a championship team. It's the 1967 Toronto Maple Leafs. I want to introduce Ron Ellis, who during that time wore the number eight, and is going to make a presentation to you. Ron? Thank you, Jared. Judith, uh, real pleasure to meet you, and uh, I agree, you are a champion. <laughs> <laughs> I was only a champion once. Uh, all those other years, we don't we forget about it. You know? Well, you so, didn't forget about 1972. <laughs> <laughs> you were a champion then as well. well thank you, Chuck. Thank you. So we have a. Uh, uh, this is just a, a photo. Okay. But we you. want to present you with. Oh with my goodness. Jersey, <laughs> and it is a Maple Leaf jersey, Judith. See, and. and uh, when we won the cup in 67, I did wear number eight. So uh, there you go. So congratulations to you. We'll just let you take a nice picture of that. Uh, well, I, I must say, I'm thrilled. I'm a, <laughs> I always have been a Maple Leaf fan, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that 67 uh, game. So You couldn't go to the rink by yourself. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> I, I think I was in high school. <laughs> Well, it's nice to meet Alex fan. Thank you, Judith, and congratulations, and thank you for being part of this.
documentary. I, I, I think it's going to do a lot of a lot of good things. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Wonderful. <laughs> I'm going to frame this. Can I just ask? Can I have a picture of us together? Yeah. Do you want the jersey in it? It's up to you. I, I, want, I just want the two of you in it. There we go. Wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, I'm delighted by this. This is, oh. this is really it's all wrapped incredible. Up in, yeah.